No weapons program in United States history demanded more heroism from the men who served it than the B-29 Super Fortress. The giant, seemingly perfect planes appeared to devastate Japan with impunity at low cost. The true story was horrifying. Far from the spotlight, the Super Fortress crew suffered wholesale death in a hurry-up testing program. There was no test pilot there or anything because they hadn't flown them, because the test pilots had gotten killed. The crews bombed at dead low altitude without guns in the face of suicide attacks. So we all went down to the flag line to say goodbye to our friends because we knew they weren't coming back. Many would fall into the hands of a furious enemy and endure unspeakable treatment as prisoners of war. How they endured to bring a war-ending torch to the enemy in an incendiary and nuclear holocaust is an epic of unsung heroism. By the last days of the war in Europe, the vaunted B-17s and B-24s that had carried the strategic bombing burden were hopelessly obsolescent for concluding the war on the Pacific front. Enemy defenses had overtaken them. High climbing fighters now reached their altitudes easily. Their bomb loads, machine gun armament, and flying ranges were pathetically inadequate to the war against the Japanese. Meanwhile, in the United States, their replacement was struggling in development. It had been designed by Boeing, and its prototypes designated XB-29. It was bigger, of course, and carried a bigger bomb load and went farther and did everything better and faster and, and higher and stronger than any other bomb rocket uh, that we'd ever seen. But there were two things that I think made it special. Uh, one was a pressurized cabin, so you didn't have to wear oxygen masks all the time, and it could be reasonably warm. You could fly in a summer flying suit and go to 40,000 feet and, and be comfortable and, and breathe oxygen without having it filtered through an oxygen system. And the second thing was the remote control firing system. Now, there wasn't, wasn't one guy behind each gun, and that's the gun that he fired, and that's all he could do. You had uh, four or five gunners spotted around various parts of the airplane, and the uh, master controller, the top gunner, central fire control gunner, could switch turrets, and it, uh, it greatly amplified the effectiveness of the fire control system. Colonel Paul Tibbetts, marked as an outstanding leader and innovator, came early to the B-29 program as a test pilot. In darkest secrecy, he would meet its greatest dangers and greatest challenges with exemplary coolness and courage. I went to Washington and saw General Eubank there. He said, you've got to go to Wichita, Kansas. That's the place they're building these airplanes and all that. Well, when I got to Wichita, I found out they weren't flying them because the Boeing Company had taken this, this position that the airplane was no good and they weren't going to make them. I understand, second-hand or third, that General Arnold told Boeing officials, you're going to build that airplane or give us back $50 million we've already advanced. They thought real quick. They said, well, we'll build the airplane, but we won't take any responsibility for it. Arnold has reported that they said, you don't have to take it. The Army Air Corps will take that responsibility. Under high pressure to deliver the B-29 system, Army Air Force Chief General Hap Arnold had begun financing and building a vast fleet of revolutionary bombers long before sufficient testing and without any proof that the plane could ever safely fly. Meanwhile, Tibbetts reported for duty. He looks at me, he said, what are you supposed to do? I said, you know, I'm supposed to fly B-29 airplanes. He looked out the window and there were five of YB service test models sitting out. He said, well, there's five airplanes out there. Go take one and fly it. Yes, sir. Nobody around there knew anything. There was no test pilot there or anything because they hadn't flown them. Tibbetts would benefit from the sacrifice of a hero who had taken on the B-29 in its earliest days with all its challenges and terrible dangers. His name was Eddie Allen, 
and risking his life was his profession. Eddie Allen was a famous test pilot during particularly the 1920s and the 1930s. It got to the point that his reputation was so good that insurance companies would sometimes refuse to insure first flights of new airplanes unless Eddie Allen was going to be the test pilot. For harrowing weeks, Allen flew dozens of hair-raising test flights, proving again that he could fly anything. He had 18 engine changes on those airplanes, and he'd had a host of other troubles. There'd been 22 carburetor changes. They'd had propeller governing and feathering problems. They'd had backfiring problems. For all his astonishing skills, Eddie Allen's luck could not last forever in the face of the B-29's failures. I was in the office when uh, Eddie called in on the radio and said he'd had a fire and he was returning to the field, and uh, the airplane crashed. Now you have a situation, you've got all of the problems that Eddie had, plus you've had a crash. Boeing flight test was decimated. We'd lost 10 of our best flight test people. Uh, we were demoralized, uh, and we were just devastated. Eddie Allen's heroic performance and death were the foundation that at last rushed the first operational B-29s into the air. Even so, there were still hideous problems being worked out. Everyone knew that the planes and their kid pilots had a long and dangerous way to go before they were fully ready. We were sending kids off to war in an airplane where they had less than 100 hours in it. In my squadron, for most of the time that we were training, we had one B-29, period. The first operational B-29 groups were rushed into service, bombing the Japanese in the China-Burma-India theater. It was very much a perilous shakedown cruise for unready men and machines, proving themselves in brutal extremities of temperature and altitude. The green kids became fine air crews, flying fine aircraft. A critically important victory for the high-flying B-29ers was being won by an earthier band of heroes. United States Marines, soldiers and sailors made an amphibious thrust across the Central Pacific in 1944, tripping the Japanese Marianas Islands, Guam, Saipan and Tinian, into the hands of the United States. Before the smoke of battle had cleared, Seabees were building the bomber strips that would be the home from which B-29s were born to fly. Quickly, a series of 8,000-foot runways were gouged out of the coral, and landing quickly upon them was an aerial armada of B-29s, the young men to fly them, the munitions to make them deadly, and a control infrastructure of incredible complexity. There had to be crew lists, targets, unit assignments, armaments, bomb loadings, formation details, assembly points, winds, checkpoints, weather, enemy defense assessments, initial points, damage reports. Every man on the ground and in the air had an indispensable, specialized job to perform perfectly if the missions were to achieve success at a cost that could be tolerated. By October 28, 1944, the first B-29 Raiders from the Marianas were ready to lift off for some of the most harrowing months of their lives. An agonizing number of the crews would never return. Many of those who did would carry physical and emotional scars all their lives. But they would fight and die to do no less than subdue an enemy who had always preferred death to surrender. Few knew, among the crews or among the oblivious people on the home front, what sacrifices were to come. You're watching Unsung Heroes here on the History Channel. 
You're watching Unsung Heroes here on the History Channel. The deadly ordeal of developing the B-29 had ended, and the terrible work of taking it to battle began. There was a sprinkling of veteran officers from European operations, but mostly it was new crews, new equipment, and a new enemy at new targets. None of the old strategic bombardment lessons learned at such cost in the skies over Europe would hold up. B-29ers are flying into the unknown. They would write the new lessons in their blood. Their enemies were not just the Japanese. With the still dicey engines cruelly overloaded with every pound of bombs, ammunition, oxygen, and gasoline that could be crammed into the planes, the crews held their breath on every takeoff, praying for each foot of altitude and against the first sound of a failing cylinder. Distance was another enemy. No aircraft had ever been asked to fly into battle with such loads over so much space. It ground down the planes and men before they ever got to their faraway targets. It was long, long missions. I'm talking 14, 15, 16, 18, sometimes 22 hours mission total. That meant seven hours up to the Empire from Tinian and seven hours back. When we first got over there, there was no friendly territory in between Tinian and the Empire. When the first B-29s approached Japan at high altitude, they discovered too late a rude and dangerous surprise of nature. The weather was a big factor because the B-29s were operating at an altitude above what any of our bomber efforts had been involved in before. We didn't know, for instance, that there was such a thing as a jet stream. I can remember being on one bombing run where uh, we were almost seen to be going backwards, bombing into, into a, about a 150 knot headwind. And uh, that's why it took us forever to get there. So we were operating in a whole new regime of weather over and above uh, where anybody had ever operated before. The uh, high altitude missions were frankly a disaster because over the Japan at those altitudes, the winds were 200 knots. So in effect, if you were coming in into the wind, you were going probably 30, 40, 50 miles an hour over the target. You were over the target so long they could shoot the heck out of you. All right, so we could turn around and come in downwind. That was the answer. No, now you're going over 300 miles an hour, and the Norton bomb site couldn't figure out when to drop those things. So as a result of it, we were really performing nothing. We were getting nowhere. Japanese fighters were at first at a loss against an enemy flying at such heights. Older interceptors couldn't perform in the thin air. When we got up at 32,000 coming in, the Japs weren't getting up to us in time. So the first couple of missions, we had a 20 millimeter in the tail, and they would be coming in, and we'd be so high, they'd be what we call hanging ducks. And the 20s just popped them out of the air. But soon the Japanese began to employ ramming tactics. First with regular fighters, then with specialized aircraft. And there was this thing called Baka bombs that we had heard about. They would appear from seemingly nowhere, seem to line up on a B-29 and ram it in the center. We learned later that it was a Jap suicide plane with a ton of TNT on the warhead, and in they would go. And when they fly in, I saw one do it. Uh, the whole plane would go up. And the one that I saw, there were no parachutes. And for all their great ability to fly high, the B-29 crews were being savaged by the ever more sophisticated and furious Japanese defenses. 
One of the enemy's chief weapons was the island of Iwo Jima, squarely astride the B-29 routes midway from the Marianas. They could pick you off coming and going. You could be limping back home from having bombed targets and trying to squeeze your gas to have enough to get back to Tinian, and uh, these guys would come sailing in on you and jump you out of Iwo. The island radioed disastrously precise warnings of the bomber force's size, altitude, and direction to the homeland, so the fighters could be scrambled and waiting. Came in at about 11 o'clock and hit us in the nose, and I don't know what kind of shell. I, I don't know details like that. But all I can tell you is that it felt like the whole plane had exploded. So we bailed out one at a time, and I was just dumb enough to go back in the in a box of food and get a turkey sandwich and white meat with mayonnaise on it and uh, some chocolate pudding before we went. One of my gunners, my right scanner, called up and says, um, and we're losing a lot of gasoline out of our right tank, out of our right wing. And I said, well, what do you estimate? And he says, it looks about like 500 gallons a minute. Well, uh, I knew we weren't going to go home. But right after that, we caught on fire, and uh, there was no choice then. I'd forgotten, for one thing, to hook up my emergency oxygen cylinder we always carried on our leg. And if you had to bail out at high altitude, and we were at 33,000 feet, and I was wearing a summer flying suit, dumb, dumb, dumb. So I fell free for what I estimated about 20,000 feet, where I could get down to where I could breathe. And uh, yes, I, I remember I made a very uh, quick prayer. It was one of many that were to come. Charles Weiser was my right gunner. He called in and said, Johnny, what are you shooting at? Where is he? Where is he? Next thing I was going through the air. I see the, uh, the airplane as it looked like a cross, fiery cross spiraling into the ground while I'm still airborne. My parachute hit, hits the ground in a big pool of flames. When the Kempe Tai, the Japanese military police, arrived, and there began my brutal experience in Japan as a prisoner of the Japanese Kempitai who are worse than Hitler's Gestapo or SS put together. It would be in the POW camps that the Japanese would vent their hatred and frustration on the airmen destroying their cities and people. In the United States at this moment, a device was being prepared to make the present devastation by the B-29ers seem mild. You're watching Unsung Heroes here on the History Channel. You're watching Unsung Heroes here on the History Channel. As the high-altitude bombing campaign against Japan faltered and bled through the opening months of 1945, an operation steeped in secrecy and genius was reaching a climax that would turn the B-29ers into the wielders of a war-ending super weapon. At a heavily guarded site in the desert, an army of the world's outstanding physicists was turning nuclear theory into an atomic weapon deliverable only by a B-29. The pioneering bombs were huge and immensely heavy. The complexities of their detonation and delivery presented enormous challenges, and the B-29ers had to meet them. Paul Tibbetts' awesome credentials with the Superfortress put him into the final selection process against aviators far senior to him. General Uzal Ent gave him the verdict. General Ent told me, he said, you were one of three officers that were put in front of me by General Arnold, I mean, their names, and he asked me who I would take. I was the junior, one was the brigadier general, one was a full colonel, and myself. He said, you may be the junior, but I told him I wanted you. He explained that they had worked on this thing and they were now at a point where they knew that it could be translated into a bomb and you will organize and train a unit to employ these weapons simultaneously in Europe and Japan. They told me it explode with the equivalent of 20,000 tons of TNT. 
Nobody had ever seen a thousand tons of TNT. Nobody had ever seen a hundred pounds of TNT. So what is 20,000 tons going to mean? All I could say, well, that's going to be a damn big explosion. And with that, that's when I made up my mind, no enemy could stand up to that thing very long. And I'm going to get on with the job. Tibbetts handpicked his crews and began a painstaking training for a mission that must not fail. Secrecy was as important as skill, and sometimes secrecy failed. I had a lieutenant colonel that I thought was going to be my operations officer. He couldn't keep his mouth shut. I told him twice, and he still couldn't do it. He had to, he was one of these guys that wanted to be big and know, you know, and everybody know he was big. So I got him sent up to the rest camp in Canada where he could talk with other people that had broken security. They could talk all they wanted. Tibbet's grueling progress toward the delivery of the atomic weapon became more urgent as the B-29ers over Japan were increasingly frustrated by both their stiff losses and the inability to deliver a knockout punch from high altitude. The commander of the 21st Bomber Command, which were all the B-29s over in the Marianas at the time, had not been performing. So General Arnold, overall commander of the 20th Air Force in Washington, replaced him with Curtis LeMay from the European Theater. LeMay, profane and impatient, was already a legend as a combat leader. His flyers loved him and would follow him into hell. And he looked at our record to date. We flew a couple of missions while he was there. And uh, he decided that uh, this we were not going to win the war this way. So he came up with the idea of flying at night at four to 6,000 feet with a full bomb load, 20,000 pounds, and uh, incendiary raid to start off with. He was the biggest thing that happened to us, I think, in, in motivationally and in every other way in getting us off the ball. Part of his planning to switch to a fire raid strategy meant making frightening changes to the B-29ers armaments. Eventually, uh, we'd leave the gunners at home and we'd leave the, uh, leave the guns at home, really, and leave the ammunition at home. And this meant you could put a bigger bomb load on the airplane. Also, bombing at a lower altitude, uh, you didn't have to climb as high, you didn't have to burn up as much fuel, and you could carry a bigger bomb load. Which is not to say that the crews were thrilled with the shocking new idea of leaving the safety of 30,000 feet for the perils of flying unarmed at 5,000 feet. Some of us said we, we should rebel. Why the hell should we go with no, absolutely no protection? So we all went down to the flight line to say goodbye to our friends because we knew they weren't coming back. But whether in the air or on the ground, there would be enough depth. Curtis LeMay, was about to put a horrifying torch to the enemy. You're watching Unsung Heroes here on the History Channel. You're watching Unsung Heroes here on the History Channel. Late winter 1945. With their high-level precision bombing a failure against a Japanese war industry scattered in small shops throughout Japan's big flammable cities, General LeMay's B-29ers prepared to inflict upon Japan an ordeal of low-level incendiary raids. And when the bombs were dropped, they would drop uh, to a certain altitude. Some kind of a shell would go off in there automatically and um, spring the parts loose. And then the little eight pound bombs would come out filled with gasoline jelly. Each plane would start about a thousand fires because there were 30 some of these little bombs in each cluster, big bomb. And then we carried 32 bombs or some number about like that. So each plane would start an estimated 1,000 fires on the ground. 
500 planes obviously start a half million fires. I recall blitz missions, there were five of them. The first one was to the capital city, Tokyo. Our altitude, bombing altitude, was 4,000 feet. Uh, we were carrying a full bomb load, 20,000 pounds of incendiary bomb. I think 297 airplanes flew on that mission that night. And uh, as we approached the uh, target area from 100, 150 miles out, we could see a sea of flames where Tokyo was. It was look, look like I would think looking into hell would look like inferno. And unfortunately, we, we could smell human flesh burning at, at 4,000 feet. Awful. We, we felt bad about that, but that's the way you win wars. Total war. By design, the pattern of fire bombs at a city center would draw in hurricane winds to force feed the flames and turn a metropolis into one huge firestorm. Thousands of feet above, the chimney effect threw the B-29ers about as though they were toys. The turbulence was so bad that some aircraft were flipped over on their back this turbulence, of course, the updraft was from the burning, hot burning fires down below, which spread over 10 square miles. And you can imagine the heat that comes up from that. Heat was not the only thing that came up to menace the B-29ers. The Japanese became masters of radar-directed searchlights. We were coned immediately from both sides with searchlights, powerful searchlights. They are demoralizing. They psychologically just wrench you because they illuminate completely the interior of the airplane. You've got to wear dark glasses. And as you travel, they are passing you from one searchlight battery to the next. You're never out of their sight. And the fear is if they can see you in searchlights, that's how their anti-aircraft uh, traction, and that was a big deal. We came back with a 176 holes in our plane on that particular mission. On the first flight to Tokyo, we burned down 17 square miles. There were more people killed in the city of Tokyo on the 10th of March than there were at Hiroshima. But it took 300 airplanes to do it instead of one. We did not relish how we did it. We did not relish killing people. We are not killers, and we had to. But on the ground in battered Japan, the downed B-29 airmen had been made to pay steadily and tragically for the bombing successes of their brothers overhead. And then I was in a zoo and I could see the big cages, the big bars, you know, and uh, it looked like lions or tigers cages to me. And then they took me in the back door of the cage and took all my clothes from me. And it was still very cold there. And uh, then because I couldn't stand well, well, then they tied my hands to the front of the bars. And I think the purpose was to let civilians come by do not fear these B-29 people, look at this one. My body was covered with running sores from the, you know, bed bugs, lice, and fleas. And I had lost a lot of weight by then, probably lost 90 pounds by then. And so you're standing there, you know, just kind of holding on, <clears throat> trying to act like an Air Corps guy, you know, with dignity. Kept in tiny, filthy cages by their Campy Thai captors and systematically starved, beaten, and denied medical attention, the prisoners had only death to anticipate. We were classed special prisoners. Let me tell you about a special prisoner. 
we were to be tried and executed as war criminals. Our fate was, was fixed. We, we were not going to live out the war. They'd grab one of those kendo clubs, and they'd, they would beat you up. I, my flying suit had an Air Force insignia on it. It was just built into the suit, you know. And they took delight on pounding that, that stars and bars of the Air Force to where my arm would just be paralyzed. In my files, I've got a copy of a Japanese general order that went out to uh, the commandants of every prison camp of, uh, that Japan had, saying, in the case of invasion, all prisoners will be immediately executed. It doesn't only say we're going to be executed. It gives a method. It says uh, you can use poison, fire, bayonets, guns, strangulation, beheading, what, however you want to do it, you can do it, but there'll be no trace remaining of that POW. The battle against Japan was being won on the ground, too. At great cost, the Marines wrested a priceless asset from the Japanese, the island of Iwo Jima. There would be no more air raid warnings sent to the homeland, no more B-29ers being jumped on the way to Japan by fighters and kamikazes flying off Iwo. the fighters would be American. Long-range P-51s able to fly escort missions from the close-in captured island. And most blessedly, there would be life-saving airstrips for the hordes of shot-up, fuel-starved B-29ers who would have disappeared into the sea otherwise. And so we had a friendly place to go at Iwo Jima on the way back, and we were so grateful. And we always will be. All B-29ers will be always forever grateful to the Marines, especially the ones that gave their lives there. Meanwhile, in the U.S., development of the most advanced weapon of mass destruction ever created neared completion. By midsummer, the missing pieces needed for the most decisive B-29 missions of the war were being hoisted into place in the desert. If the test device worked, delivery of the atomic bomb to Japan by Super Fortress would be just days away. Watching Unsung Heroes here on the History Channel. You're watching Unsung Heroes here on the History Channel. By early August of 1945, the two atomic bombs successfully tested just days ago had arrived on Tinian. The brutal training routines for the delivery of the weapons were now ready to be proved in combat by Colonel Paul Tibbetts and his hand-picked B-29ers. So I went to Dr. Oppenheimer and I said, OK, when we dropped bombs in Europe, we flew straight ahead and they exploded behind us. He said, that's right. You can't do that now. And he said, you've got to get tangent to it immediately so that you will, in the length of time it takes that explosion to get, you will be 159 degrees tangent to that shock wave. It was difficult to do it because the tail would start to stall out on you. And I had to take it as far as I could take it and not snap the tail off of the airplane. The two A-bombs on Tinian were different from one another. Their makeup and mechanisms for firing had been developed simultaneously. Each was a backup for a possible failure of the other. The bomb destined to fall on Hiroshima was called Little Boy. 
the one that would doom Nagasaki was Fat Man. A target list was picked, with alternates chosen if weather prevented the required visual bombing. The great size and weight of the A-bombs meant that they had to be hoisted and loaded into the planes out of special pits. There was some trepidation that a crash on takeoff might set off an explosion of a bomb's high explosive trigger and scatter enough radioactive material from the U-235 core to close the whole island down. Tibbet's plane, the Enola Gay, named after his mother, would fly its combat mission alone with two instrument planes following behind. It found that the Japanese didn't bother individual airplanes. They know that the, they had found out that they were weather reconnaissance airplanes or photographic airplanes or something else and were not going to do them any damage. On the morning of August 6, 1945, Paul Tibbet started the Enola Gay toward its date with history. No commander ever had more on his shoulders. My thoughts were running faster than I filmed through the camera because I, my only concern until the bomb dropped it and exploded was, have I made any mistakes along the way? The primary target was Hiroshima. Weather planes over Japan monitored conditions over the target. The tense miles melted away. The Japanese coast appeared. It was a clear and beautiful day. The Enola Gay's bombardier and navigator helped confirm the target. I looked out over the nose and I said, yeah, there's no doubt in my mind, that is Hiroshima. I could see it just as clearly. I could see the lines in the palm of my hand. We had a 72-mile bomb run, which took us maybe four minutes at the speed we were going. We were going right at 300 miles an hour, true airspeed. The bomb fell. The crew held its breath. Tibbets was ready for his desperate turn away from the expected blast. I had my hands right up there on the yoke. I don't know how many seconds ahead of time, but I was ready because I had my feet on the rudders. I wanted to put that thing into that turn the moment I could. And that was the only thing I thought about. Each man in the crew had been instructed to report in turn what he would see below at the moment of impact. I don't know what I said. I don't know what anybody else said. Because when you see something of that magnitude, I guess is the best word, it, it kind of joggles your mind. How do you describe it? Seeing the city perfectly visible as a place where a lot of humans were moving about. If you could see it, you could see movement. But when I flew back by it and I was out to co pilot's window, I thought I'd look at it next look. All I saw was something that reminded me of a boiling pot of tar. Tibbet's quick turn had taken the Enola Gay 10 miles away when the shock wave hit. You don't hear the explosion. You get the shock wave because these shock waves traveled faster than sound. And it came up and hit us. Leaving some 130,000 people dead on the ground, the Enola Gay turned toward home. Her crew would carry their sobering mission within themselves forever. The secrecy of the mission vanished forever as the Enola Gay returned to Tinian and tumultuous welcome by the press and the top brass. Within a week, a second B-29 boxcar, commanded by Major Charles Sweeney, took the atomic bomb, codenamed Fat Man, to Nagasaki after the primary target of Kokura was weathered in. This time, 80,000 people died in a flash.
There was nobody but the plane's ground crew to welcome the return of Boxcar. Two of the engines died for want of fuel as she taxied in. Still, the Japanese fought on. LeMay called me, he says, you got another one of those damn things? I said, yes, sir, we do. He said, where is it? I said, it's in Wendover, and I got an airplane back there to carry it. He said, get it out here. Blessedly, the B-29ers needed to deliver no more death to Japan. The Japanese laid down their arms on August 15, 1945, and none too soon for the B-29 captives. The atomic bomb saved my life and saved over 300,000 other prisoners, and also millions, probably millions of Japanese who would fight sticks, stones, whatever, when our invasion started. Beautiful nurses, clean-looking doctors, medical staff, and we were in heaven, and we were rescued. The B-29ers went home, but only for a while. They weren't done soldiering. Crews who thought their fighting days were over were called back into the sky to fight the unexpected onslaught of communism in the Korean War. For three years, they held their own against cannon-armed red jet fighters that could fly rings around. But they bombed on, and when they were done, they had run themselves out of targets. Again, the B-29 heroes couldn't be stopped. In my day, you were given a job, and you, you salute and say, yes, sir, and that's it. I was on the ground at Hickam Field on the 7th of December, 1941, when the Japanese hit the place. And I was in the B-29 formation as we flew over the Missouri when the war officially was concluded. And uh, I kind of felt like that was my personal war. <laughs> The coming of the jet age shut down the aerial giants and the unsung heroes who flew them. They had survived the deadly mistakes of development and gone on to carry their thunder to an enemy who had sworn never to quit. What their sacrifice had won was nothing less than the Second World War.